Nature is full of different species of organisms. What happened to cause this? How did the world get so many different species? Let's take a look at speciation processes, the way in which new species arise. The basic process of species formation works like this. First, two species start as a single reproductively connected group. This is just one species to start with. Then two groups diverge so that they're not reproductively connected. This is the next step to creating two species. For the final step, these two groups must remain disconnected even if in the same place. The isolation of the two new groups has to be based on their biology, not just their location or opportunity. In this video, we'll look at four main modes of speciation that have been defined. Allopatric, peripatric, parapatric, and sympatric speciation. At the very end, I'll also mention another form of speciation that a lot of textbooks don't talk about. The first mode of speciation is allopatric speciation. In this process, a population becomes divided due to geographic isolation. Over time, due to their isolation from one another, the populations diverge. Eventually, they diverge so much that they are unable to interbreed even if reconnected. The diagram illustrates this process. We start with one population where all the individuals are similar and then it gets split into two. Over time, they diverge, represented by one becoming lighter in color and the other becoming darker. Later, if the populations are reconnected, these differences may be so large that the two populations don't interbreed and there are now two distinct species. Speciation has occurred. This is often thought of as the main form of speciation. That's debatable. Professional evolutionary biologists can and do debate which of the speciation modes we're going to talk about is the most common. This is certainly the mode taught the most in introductory biology courses because it's the easiest to understand. A famous example of allopatric speciation comes from Darwin's finches. Darwin's finches are 18 species of birds, and they're actually tanagers, not finches, in the Glabix Islands. Their closest relative is the yellow-faced grass quit, which lives in Central America. When we make a phylogeny for them, they're a monophyletic group descended from a single migration event about 2 million years ago. Across the islands, there are a number of different species, and while they have evolved to have a variety of different morphologies and lifestyles, including one vampire species, they are all more closely related to one another than they are to any other species outside of the Galapagos. Speciation therefore seems to have happened on the different islands after a single immigration event, otherwise the finch species would be paraphyletic or polyphyletic. This is because multiple migration events would result in some of the later arriving species in the Galapagos being more closely related to the mainland than the finches that were already there. By the way, I've put links to scientific papers which include more details in the video description below. For example, this phylogeny is a version of one from a paper in the AUK published in 2018. There's a link to that paper below. Throughout this video, I've simplified the examples I'm talking about, but if you want all the details, just check out the original papers. Another example of allopatric speciation comes from snapping shrimp in the genus Alpheus, which live near Panama. Approximately 3 million years ago, a land bridge formed, isolating populations of the shrimp on each side. The pattern of the phylogeny for these shrimp makes it obvious that the land bridge divided a series of populations, doubling the number of distinct lineages. Geologic features that can isolate populations change all the time. Land bridges form, continental plates move, rivers change their courses, providing ample opportunity for allopatric speciation. The last example of allopatric speciation involves a group of fish called sticklebacks. Sticklebacks live worldwide and in lakes in the Pacific Northwest. These lakes were once connected, but during the last ice age became isolated. Detailed genetic, developmental, and ecological studies confirm that allopatric speciation and more has occurred in these species. In fact, sticklebacks are a model system in lots of other evolutionary studies, especially adaptation of their defensive spines versus predators. For example, some lakes have predators and some don't, and the sticklebacks have evolved their spines accordingly. Our next speciation mechanism is peripatric speciation. In this scenario, a very small population becomes separated from a main population. Allopatric speciation occurs, but small populations are prone to genetic drift and founder effects. These random effects mean that the speciation happens quicker and coincides with dramatic genetic and morphological changes. You can think of this as a subset of allopatric speciation, but quicker and with random factors playing a larger role due to the small population size. Because peripatric speciation is basically a special case of allopatric speciation, it's hard to distinguish between them in nature. However, we can do experiments. Drosophila lab experiments show that small populations isolated from others can become reproductively isolated very quickly. This can happen via peripatric and sympatric modes, and a major factor is often the loss of mating behaviors and preferences. In fact, if you think about it, Darwin's finches and other island species may be peripatric, not just allopatric. However, it's hard to distinguish them without genetic analyses looking for severe inbreeding, major genome rearrangements, etc. 
Even though peripatric speciation is just a special case of allopatric speciation, it may result in different modes of evolution. Because of this, peripatric speciation was invoked by Eldridge and Gould as a mechanism for their proposed model of evolution by punctuated equilibrium. This is the name for a pattern of evolution with periods of stasis punctuated by periods of rapid change that occurred during peripatric speciation events. This punctuated equilibrium model was proposed in the 1970s and created a big debate about how speciation itself may be directly related to most morphological change. The debate has mainly been resolved in favor of gradualism as the primary mode of evolutionary change, albeit with some space for rapid change. Gould and Eldridge's claim about these changes always coinciding with speciation is not widely accepted. The consensus is that there is little evidence that this speciation process is as widespread and important as the others. Our third speciation process is peripatric speciation. In this scenario, a population experiences a range of conditions across its distribution. This leads to differing local adaptations and traits. This is conceptually illustrated in the figure by one end of the distribution adapting to become dark while the other is light. While each end of the distribution may be well adapted to one set of conditions, the hybrids between them and the hybrid zone may be less fit because they're not well adapted to either condition. If that occurs, then selection favors reduced mating with dissimilar individuals. Reinforcement, which we'll talk about later, can lead to reproductive isolation. It can be hard to demonstrate peripatric speciation since there is still some gene flow, but there are some examples. A cool example involves little green bulls, Andropodus virens, a small green bird which lives in the rainforest and ecotones, forest edges, in Cameroon. Smith et al. from 1997 measured morphological traits like tarsus length and beak size from 12 different populations. Six populations were from the forests and six were from the ecotones, as shown in the figure. They also used genetic data to measure migration rates between the populations. They then compared each pair of populations. The figure shows what they compared. On the x-axis, they looked at the gene flow as measured by the migration rate. On the y-axis, they showed the morphological divergence, how different the physical traits of the populations were from each other. Locations and comparison for the forest populations to each other are shown in black, while ecotone locations in their comparisons are shown in yellow. Comparisons between sites that differed in habitat type are shown in green. Even though the populations were connected by some migration, they saw some interesting patterns indicating peripatric speciation. First, there was morphological similarity for the populations within each habitat type, regardless of distance and gene flow. That's shown by the black and yellow dots having small values for morphological divergence. Second, there was morphological differentiation between habitat type. That's shown by the green dots in the figure being higher than the black or yellow dots. Lastly, the morphological distance seen, those values of three and four on the y-axis, are as big as the values obtained for comparing other completely different species to each other. Although these birds are still reproductively connected for now, the populations that live in the different habitats now look like two completely different species. The last of our major modes of speciation is sympatric speciation. In this mode, no spatial separation or barriers are required. In sympatric speciation, local conditions create behavioral variability in resource use. This leads to positive assortative mating due to proximity. It can also lead to small-scale peripatric type effects. This is illustrated in the figure by the new species arising completely within the range of the other. Again, the key factor is that no physical or geographic barriers or distance is involved. The most famous example of sympatric speciation comes from the hawthorn fly, Ragaletis, native to North America. The lifestyle of these flies is that they lay eggs and fruit, the fruit then falls down to the ground, and the larvae and the fruit burrow into the ground after eating the fruit. Ancestrally, these flies lay their eggs in hawthorns, a plant native to North America. Apple trees were introduced to North America approximately 300 years ago, and Ragaletis flies are now seen on both types of fruit. Hawthorns and apples can grow right next to each other, and flies can easily move between them. DNA studies show that the allele frequencies of the flies collected from the two different types of fruit are very different. This indicates very little interbreeding. What's happening is that the flies choose their larval fruit as substrate for eggs when they're adults, so cross-fruit matings are only about 6% of matings. Even though there is nothing preventing these flies from encountering each other, by preferring different fruit, they are starting to diverge into two distinct species. Another famous example of sympatric speciation comes from East Africa Rift Valley cichlids. In addition to allopatric speciation in the lakes, there are also phenotypically and genetically distinct morphs within multiple lakes, lakes Malawi and Masoko in particular. These different color fish live in different parts of the lake, littoral versus benthic, and have different diets. Phylogenetic studies indicate that the littoral and benthic populations in the lakes, 
Lake Nosaka, for example, are more closely related to each other than they are to any other fish. These two species diverged after being separated as a single population when the lake formed. While they use different parts of the lake, littoral ones use the shoreline, whereas benthic ones swim deeper, they are often encountered together and mix easily. Detailed studies have shown that sexual selection seems to be involved in assisting with the reproductive isolation. Incidentally, the sticklebacks from earlier also seem to be sympatrically speciating in their lakes too. Sympatric speciation in lakes seems to be common. This brings us to something that's important in all of these speciation processes. The processes we've looked at get speciation started, but as long as the populations can still interbreed, then they can mix and lose their distinctiveness quickly. All speciation processes are accelerated by reinforcement, also called the Wallace effect after Alfred Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution, when hybrids are less fit. Initial post-zygotic factors such as outbreeding depression, lowered fitness and crosses between two very different individuals, or inviable zygotes, will select for pre-zygotic isolation. This is because individuals are incurring an energetic cost to produce less fit offspring or wasting gametes in fruitless reproductive events. Individuals which avoid mating with the wrong partners, those outside their group, will have higher fitness because all their zygotes will be viable and their offspring won't suffer from outbreeding depression. This leads to selection for prezygotic isolation mechanisms like gametic isolation, where the eggs don't get fertilized, sexual isolation, for example, mismatched genitalia, required mating behaviors, differing mating times, and finally ecological separation, where they don't encounter the other individuals at all and risk making hybrids. Each step along the continuum, illustrated on the right, is advantageous compared to the previous one. Natural selection on individuals will therefore move a population from outbreeding depression to inviable zygotes to gametic isolation to sexual isolation and finally to ecological separation. Lastly, I promised a bonus mode of speciation when we started, and it involves the rare cases in which hybrids are not less healthy. Sometimes members from two populations mate and create hybrids reproductively isolated from both previous populations. This is speciation in one generation. This process is most common in polyploid plants, which can self, but not easily backcross. In general, this happens more in plants because they can tolerate mismatched chromosomal numbers better than animals. There are a few animal examples, mostly in insects. However, there's one mammal species that seems to have arisen as a hybridization between two other species, the Clymene dolphin. Genetic studies show that these dolphins are the result of a hybridization event between spinner and striped dolphins. They're their own species now, not due to allopatry, peripatry, parapatry, or sympatry, but because of hybridization. Life keeps evolving, and there are several different ways that new species can arise over time. These processes have led to the fantastic diversity of living organisms we see today. As usual, a high-resolution version of this image is available at the Evolution Examples website. If you enjoyed this video, click, subscribe, or like to easily find it and other videos about evolutionary biology in the future.